Thank you for joining us today at the May 4th, 2017 business meeting. And I'm gonna turn it over to our County Administrator, Don Krupp. Well, uh, good morning, commissioners. It is a beautiful spring day. I understand the weather is going to return uh, back to rainy weather for the, uh, for the upcoming weekend. So I guess we should enjoy today as much as we can. Uh, we are joined this morning uh, from County Council, Mr. Stephen Madcor. He'll be up uh, at the dais in a moment. And of course, uh, Mary Rathke, our clerk to the board. I'll uh, go ahead and uh, conduct the roll. Commissioner Humberston? Here. Commissioner Fisher? Here. Commissioner Schrader? Here. Commissioner Savas? Here. Chair Bernard? Here. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, the first uh, items on the agenda are a couple presentations. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The first presentation is uh, a proclamation that would proclaim the week of May 7, 2017 as Clean and Plentiful Drinking Water Week in Clackamas County. I'm going to invite our Director of Water Environment Services, Greg Keist, up to the uh, dais, and then he will introduce two others to speak to you this morning. Morning, Chair Bernard, uh, commissioners. Uh, we're here to talk about my favorite subject, clean water, today. And I'm going to be joined by Joel Ferguson with Health and Human Services and Kim Swan from the Clackamas River Water Providers. Uh, for over the past 35 years, the American Water Works Association has designated uh, uh, Drinking Water Week, and it's a way for uh, water professionals and communities they serve to celebrate uh, clean and cold and clear drinking water. Um, at their April meeting, the Clackamas River Water Providers requested that the uh, county commissioners adopt a resolution declaring a uh, clean drinking water week, clean and safe drinking water week uh, uh, for Clackamas County for the week of May 7th through the 13th. And so that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, uh, we're not, the county, Wes, is not a drinking water provider, but we do provide important uh, uh, support for drinking water. I don't know if people know this, but uh, three communities, Estacada, Sandy, and Boring, all discharge treated wastewater uh, to the Clackamas River upstream of the drinking water intakes. So uh, us doing our job in the wastewater uh, field is critically important to uh, good drinking water as well. Uh, also, Wes provides surface water services so we treat uh, stormwater, particularly in the Clackamas industrial area, um, that also discharges to the uh, Clackamas River before the drinking water intakes. So it's very much a team effort uh, when it comes to clean drinking water. Um, I will, oh, one thing I wanted to, to call attention to, uh, this year, uh, beginning this summer, we're gonna be doing a project on Carley Creek, and it's a, uh, treatment wetland that will control runoff from over 400 acres in the Clackamas industrial area. So that runoff that now just gets directly piped to Carly Creek will go through a treatment wetland and then be discharged to Carly Creek, which then discharges to the Clackamas River. So we, uh, again, want to contribute uh, what we can uh, towards clean drinking water. And with that, I will hand it off to Joel Ferguson from Health and Human Services. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. Uh, I'm from Health, Housing, and Human Services Public Health Program, and we provide access to safe drinking water, which is essential to human health. Each person requires at least 20 to 50 liters of clean and safe uh, water a day for drinking, cooking, and uh, simply keeping themselves clean. Oregon Drinking Water Services contracts with Clackamas County Public Health's Environmental Health to operate the program. The program administers and enforces drinking water quality standards for public water systems in Clackamas County that use groundwater and serves a population of 3,300 or less. Clackamas County has about 320 of these public water systems that meet this criteria, which is the most of any county in Oregon. Um, a water, an on-site water system survey is conducted of these systems once every three to five years. And most of them are in the rural, rural county areas. So um, Clackamas County Public Health Drinking Water 
program as a resource for public water system operators uh, and the public when dealing with water quality alerts, public notices, water monitoring and testing, and sanitary hazard analysis. Okay, thank you. All right, hello, my name is uh, Kim Swan. I'm the water resource manager for the Clackamas River Water Providers. The Clackamas River Water Providers is a coalition of nine cities and water districts that get their drinking water out of the Clackamas River. Combined, we serve drinking water to almost 300,000 people here in Clackamas County. We implement two programs, a source water protection program and a public outreach and education program with the purpose and intent of um, preserving and, and, and conserving the Clackamas River as a high quality drinking water source and to enable us to keep future drink drinking water treatment costs uh, low. Um, the Clackamas River Water Provider and its members work hard um, to protect our drinking water source from its source all the way to your taps um, so that we can provide our citizens with high quality drinking water um, that's convenient to protect public health, to provide fire flows, and to support the economic growth for our communities. So um, I would like you to thank you today for recognizing National Drinking Water Week and the importance that public drinking water provides to our communities. Great, thank you very much. Is somebody gonna read the proclamation? I will read the proclamation. All right. Uh, proclaiming May 7th to the 13th, 2017 as Clean and Plentiful Drinking Water Week in Clackamas County. Whereas water is our most valuable natural resource and we are fortunate to have high quality sources in Clackamas County, most notably the Clackamas River, and whereas our public water systems deliver amazingly reliable water service to over 300,000 customers in Clackamas County every day. And whereas for less than a penny per gallon, public water systems customers get in-home delivery of a product that is essential for life and health. And whereas public water supplies increase public safety by feeding fire sprinkler systems and fire hydrants. And whereas public water system customers are the beneficiaries of the investments previous generations have made in the infrastructure that delivers all of the aforesaid benefits and more. And whereas Clackamas County has a strategic priority to honor, utilize, promote, and invest in our natural resources. And whereas Clackamas County departments provide critical services that protect both public and private drinking water supplies through wastewater and stormwater utility management, watershed management, hazardous materials and solid waste disposal, spill prevention and response, septic and on-site wastewater programs, and private well testing. Now, therefore, it is hereby proclaimed that Clackamas County Board of Commissioners declares May 7th to the 13th, 2017 as Clean and Plentiful Drinking Water Week in Clackamas County. We encourage all citizens to join us in celebrating our valuable natural resource of clean and plentiful drinking water in Clackamas County, dated this fourth, May of, fourth day of May, 2017. Great, thank you very much. Uh, entertain a motion. I move we proclaim the week of May 7, 2017 as Clean and Plentiful Drinking Water Week in Clackamas County. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, proclaim the week of May 7, 2017 as Clean and Plentiful Drinking Water Week for Clackamas County. Any further discussion? Yes, I just have a, just a question. Um, great to uh, have this before us today and, you know, my background, I even believe um, Commissioner Humberson's background in water, uh, but I go back into about the year um, 1998, I think when I sat on my first water-related budget committee and learned more about this. Um, so my question as a county commissioner, Wes, DHS, and everyone, how much interaction is there between Wes and these private, these private uh, wells or for these private systems, these small systems that you, you uh, how much, is there any interaction? Yes, uh, and I'll let Joel speak to that. The, uh, yeah. Public health, yeah. Um, we, I am out at water systems uh, every three to five years, and then also I'm in, I'm in contact with water operators all the time. So I'm out on site every three to five years at a minimum, and then if there's uh, follow-up work from a water system survey, that so I could be out there, you know, within a month or two after the survey. So I'm I'm working directly with mostly operators of the water system, but I also talk to residents who are on that water system if they have concerns or anything like that. I'm I guess what I was specifically driving at is that your, your or our interaction 
between the water purveyors, the districts, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for example, or the Clackamas River water providers? Is there any interaction between DHS in your capacity uh, or your department uh, with that regard? Is there, because I just wasn't aware of it in my previous roles that we, that there were so many, as you said, yeah, stated in your yeah, presentation, I, there were so many of these systems out there. As some of the small water systems I work with are privately owned, you know, a mobile home park or a restaurant, you know, that serves the public. So that's how I would be working directly with the owner of that water system. Or there's a, a number of small uh, water districts up toward Mount Hood that, you know, that serves 80, 90 homes. And so it has their, they have their own little um, a board for the water system, and then I can work with, you know, if all the board members show up and then the, their um, certified operator shows up, then I'll work with directly with them. Okay, great. That's all I yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. With that, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstaining? Hearing none? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is a presentation for mental health awareness in Clackamas County. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to invite uh, Mary Rumbaugh, who is our Director of Behavioral Health with our Health, Housing, and Human Services Department up to the uh, table to address you on this presentation. Thank you for coming today. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Bernard, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Mary Rumbaugh, and I'm the Director of Clackamas uh, Behavioral Health Division, and we are here today to highlight May as Mental Health um, Awareness Month, and today we're actually gonna present on the role of peers uh, in mental health. In addition, last year the board did um, uh, formally recognize uh, that annually Clackamas Behavioral Health Division would uh, do a Super Heart Hero Award, honoring folks in our community who are moving forward um, the intent of successful mental health services in our community, so we will be doing that at the end. I would like to introduce Allie Linfoot, who is our peer coordinator, and she'll be doing the presentation today. Great, okay, thank you. Good morning, uh, Chair Bernard and commissioners. My name is Allie Linfoot. I am the peer services coordinator for the Behavioral Health Division within Health, Housing, and Human Services. Um, first of all, I think it's important to define what peer support is. So peer services are um, offered to people within Clackamas County that are struggling with mental health or addiction. Um, the people providing the support have lived experience of one or both conditions, um, and we, it has been shown to be a really effective addition to traditional treatment methods. Um, make sure I hit the right arrow. Um, so a peer support specialist provides assistance, support, and encouragement uh, to those that are working towards recovery. Uh, some of those common activities that a peer support specialist might um, work with an individual on is uh, advocacy, helping to uh, also help the person learn self-advocacy, uh, what we call experiential sharing, um, which is really just sharing our lived experience stories, building community, uh, mentoring and coaching, connecting to resources, socializing and self-esteem building, and systems navigation. Uh, peer support specialists also have an additional uh, responsibility of working as change agents within either the providers that they work for or within systems where they work uh, to help facilitate cultural change. Um, these, this type of support work is we say it's fairly new, it's been around for a long, long time, just hasn't necessarily been recognized. Um, so that is another one of the, the system change things that they work on. Uh, requirements to do this kind of work, there is training involved. Um, our traditional health worker commission, which is a state commission, uh, makes sure that we have a curriculum available for that. Uh, peers are required to have 40 hours of training. Uh, if you're a, what we call a peer wellness specialist, which is a peer who not only works um, with people with uh, mental health or addiction struggles, but also addresses phys chronic physical illness, uh, receive an additional 40 hours training to address those physical conditions. Um, currently in the state, uh, we have about 1,189 peer support specialists registered. We have 95 of those working in Clackamas County. 
Uh, we have 45 peer wellness specialists registered in the state. They're a much lower number, but they're also a very specialized type of peer support. Um, let's see, sorry, I got behind. <laughs> so the history of our program here in Clackamas. Um, this all started in 2009 with uh, the behavioral health redesign. Uh, what came out of that redesign was my position, and um, it uh, actually was, was quite innovative at the time, um, and it was really recognizing that peer supports are critical components to sustained recovery for people with uh, mental health conditions and addictions. Um, the peer services coordinator, my position, um, really was hired to take a look at our system of care and develop a peer support system of care that works in cooperation with our treatment systems and many of our other systems such as corrections, um, law enforcement, child welfare, all those other ancillary systems that families and, and individuals tend to touch when they're struggling with these difficulties. Um, we wrote an RFP to create a comprehensive array of services and then uh, chose contractors based on that RFP to provide these services. So um, the development of this was not only just me sitting at my desk deciding what Clackamas needed, but it was uh, pulling a steering committee together of um, people, peers, peers working in the community, representatives from peer-run organizations. Um, we had about 18 people. Uh, four of us were county staff. The rest were youth or young adults, family members, and adult peers. Um, they identified really the values that should drive this system, strategies for implementation. We developed supporting documents like the logic model, elements of what is peer support services and what roles are we really needing in our community here, and then measures and outcomes. There we go. And the result of that was 16 programs, uh, some for adults, some for transition age youth, some for families who have children involved in systems, and then another category that are those that, are, that really are serving all, and I'll explain those a little bit. So for adults, uh, we have peers that are uh, housed, or not housed, but stationed in our supportive housing locations, like out at Villa Bois and a couple of others. Um, we have peers in our county clinic. Uh, we have peers at Centerstone in our working with uh, crisis and safety net services. We have peers that go into our jail. Uh, we have a brand new set of peers that are going to start working closely with our sheriff's department in the behavioral health unit. Uh, we have peers in our mental health drug courts and family courts. Um, we have an adult drop-in center um, that runs in Oregon City, and we have two uh, youth drop-in centers, one specifically for LGBTQ youth and uh, one in Milwaukee that, that serves all youth. Um, we have support groups, and our various providers are Mental Health Association of Oregon, Cascadia Peer Wellness, Folk Time, Stay Clean, Dual Diagnosis, they work with adults. For our transition age youth, we have Youth Move, who runs our drop-in center in Milwaukee. Um, coincidentally, they're right across the street, Chair Bernard, from your auto shop. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, they provide one-on-one -on -one peer support and navigation. Um, and then I mentioned uh, our LGBTQ youth can get support from the living room. Um, our families, we have family partners that work in our behavioral health division downstairs. Um, they are partnered with our family facilitators to work with families receiving wraparound services or wraparound, the wraparound process. Um, Youth partners, that's something we've been working on. Um, we have an RFP that's going out uh, to provide support uh, to youth that's been in the works for about a year. Um, and then we have community education and support groups uh, for families. Uh, we have uh, peers that I mentioned before work within child welfare, both peers that work with families from the children's side, with children who are in foster care or in mental health services, and adult peers who work with parents who are struggling with their own mental health or addiction issues. <coughs> Excuse me. And then serving all, what that means is providing community education and support groups to family members, such as NAMI. Um, the David Rompre Warmline peer staff, uh, we were providing resources to fund that up until, I think, two years ago in the state. 
uh, then decided they would do that, but we still wanted to contribute, so um, they work out of our center stone um, uh, location on 82nd. They have a desk there to field calls. Um, and we have Folk Time, who provides peers within uh, Center Stone um, and actually other places, too. Um, so here's some of the data. Um, this is comparative data. So the green bar is 2015. The, the blue bar is 2016. Uh, so last year, we served slightly less. We served about 4,695 than what we did in 2015. Uh, but we had some changes in some programs, uh, change in contractor, so we were sort of restarting some of these things. I expected a bit of a drop. Um, for our drop-in centers, they're serving around, <coughs> excuse me, 1,000 people. Um, support groups, uh, we have about 4,000 people that are, that are utilizing those supports. Um, the outreach activities in, uh, to system and community partners, that's part of the contract with our contractors. Their, their requirement is to do outreach activities to those systems that, the, that people are referred from, such as our jail, child welfare, schools, et cetera. Um, and then part also is that we want peers to continually receive training to further their skills uh, in providing this kind of support. And there was 378 um, staff and training activities that peers took place in, and we really attribute, attribute the jump to that number in the implementation of Get Trained to Help, um, which is through our health promotion and prevention uh, group. Um, experience of services. So this is people who are using these services, self-reporting how this is helping them or not helping them. Um, and I really want to point out here that feeling accepted in their community that was a huge jump this year, and, and what I really believe is that this is a cumulative effect of six years of providing this type of service and also the work that our health promotion and prevention folks have done with our community in being educated on what mental illness is, what that means, what, what addiction recovery is, and what that means to the community. Um, it was, it, that is a huge factor in somebody's recovery, is really feeling accepted in the place that they live. For children and families, um, you can see we've had a little bit of dip in most of those. I'm, I haven't figured out quite yet why, but I want to point out again, feeling accepted in their community more than doubled. That is a huge accomplishment. In past years, we have really stuck right around that 30%. Um, and again, attributed to the cumulative activities of peer support and health promotion. Um, so this slide illustrates where um, children and what other systems children and families are touching. So most family receiving peer support services, they have children involved in foster care or in child welfare, um, juvenile justice, uh, parents may be involved in adult addiction treatment services, or in one of our adult courts, meaning uh, drug court, mental health court, or criminal court. Cost savings. Um, I do want to point out that this data is from fiscal year, uh, that says 14 down there, I apologize, it's fiscal year 15. Um, and these cost savings can be attributed to peer support services. In the jail during this time, we had targeted the top 50 recidivists coming into the jail, those, the, mostly the men that, that are the, they're coming in sort of through that revolving door every week. And we would have peers make contact with them, support them, while they're in the jail, even if they're in for a short period of time, meeting them as they come out, supporting them in that transition back to community. And we had a 2% recidivism rate during that program. Um, cost savings to child welfare. What we discovered with child welfare is parents who have access to a family partner, uh, their children are coming home 11 months so sooner than children whose families do not have access to a family partner, which comes out to cost savings. Um, warm line calls. Um, warm line does a uh, survey at the, the end of the call to find out what would you have done if warm line was not uh, available to you. And if somebody says, I would have gone to the emergency room, then there's a cost attached to that. Uh, the cost of peer services in fiscal year 2015 was $1.7 million uh, to provide these services to the community. 
One of the other things uh, that we're doing in peer services is um, Clackamas County has some no has pretty great notoriety in the state of Oregon and across the country at this point. Um, I speak at conferences, I speak at summits, um, I get contacted on a monthly basis by other states, by other counties in our state, by um, uh, provider networks that want to know how we're doing this and how we're getting the outcomes that we are. So I spend some time doing that and providing uh, information uh, and support, technical assistance. Are there any questions? Any questions? I just have a, a comment. Thank you for all the work you do because um, we are the service provider and the manager and the coordinator for mental health. This is not a function that our municipalities have. This is one of the key things that counties do uh, that add capacity for our municipalities, our cities, and our unincorporated area. We serve everyone. And I know we work collaboratively with the state as well, but we're where this kind of treatment, this kind of help, this with the boots on the ground happens. So thank you for all your hard work um, and for all that you do for the citizens of Clackamas County. It sounds like the redesign investment in you has been uh, beneficial. Uh, I had one question about where you get your funding. How are you funded? So um, that's a great uh, question, Chair Bernard. So we have a mix of, we are able to use some of our uh, Medicaid dollars that we have with our contract with HealthShare of Oregon. So they have invested in uh, peer services and the state through state general fund, uh, we actually do get a unique service element through our contract that we hold with the, with the Oregon Health Authority. So again, there is recognition of the role of peers and the value of peers. Um, so that's, that's, that's where that 1.7 million is coming from. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Savas? Yeah, I appreciate the presentation. Um, uh, ideally, maybe we can actually have this in like a work session, because when I saw your graphs, you know, I, I really, I actually have a lot of questions, but sure. I don't think this is the appropriate place for that. But uh, that, that uh, did trigger when I saw your graphs there, that data that really inspired a lot of questions that I just think would take more time than we have, so. Great, okay. Be honored. All right, with that, uh, we're going to do a photo op. No, they, what? Yeah, yeah if, oh. if we can do that, yeah, the photo op with the, the award recipients, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Chair Bernard, for bringing us to that. So as, as I spoke earlier um, last year, the board did uh, um, allow us to formally recognize individuals who are doing impressive work in this community. So I have the honor of recognizing um, five individuals, we added a fifth, because that's what we do here. Um, so if we could have, actually, uh, is it okay if we have folks go ahead and come up as I as I name them, and then we can do a photo op, thank you. Um, so I'd like to honor Janie Marsh, who is with Mental Health Association of Oregon. Amanda Willard, if you guys wanna come up, with Youth Move. Shannon Farr with Folk Time. Angela Prater with the David Romney Warmline and LifeWorks of Northwest. And David, Diedrichsen with Homeless Veterans Peer Support here in Clackamas County. We want to really recognize these individuals for bringing their heart, their passion, their soul to this work. They, they are who do this work and make us look really, really great here in Clackamas County. So I really want to honor them uh, for, their, for their hard work. Great. Thank you very much. Are we going to do the photo? Oh. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, with that, we're going to move on to citizen communication. We have Peter Nordby and William Street. So, William, was your dad Bill Street? Uh, yes, but not the one you're thinking of. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, Peter, you're up first. I thought I put my phone on uh, silence, oh. but it didn't. Thank you. My name is Peter Nordby, and I'm here today in capacity as chair of Clackamas County Democratic Party. On behalf of the Clackamas Par uh, Democratic Party, I'd like to thank you for your efforts to protect all of our residents against unconstitutional and unlawful actions of the current administration. We understand that the risks involved in seeking to provide every resident with due process, obey ORS 181A 820, and comply with 2014 court case and not violate mandatory federal requirements. That's why at our last Democratic um, Central Committee meeting by unanimous vote, the Democratic Party of Clackamas County passed a resolution supporting your efforts to make Clackamas County a safe place for all of our residents to participate in civic life, to go to work, to attend school, and avail, them, avail themselves to county uh, protections and services. There was a considerable conversation at your policy session about criminal safety and the law. What was not discussed in depth uh, is the reality that the law is not colorblind. These issues are not black, and white, neither are they brown or white. There's considerable research that documents that people of color are routine, routinely not viewed or treated as uh, innocent until proven guilty. For the past two decades, many law enforcement agencies have adopted an enforcement approach based on an erroneous uh, assumption that if they, are in, they enforce the law for minor misdemeanors as if they were felonies they would prevent felonies. In reality, all that resulted from this racial profiling was the creation of a reserve army of criminalized immigrants who are now vulnerable to deportation. The structural failure of the law has not made our community safer. To the contrary, when migrants and citizens of color see law enforcement as a threat rather than a protector, crime increases because the victims are too scared to report crimes. It's also highlighted at your policy session the one-third drop in domestic violence reports, the increase in absenteeism at our schools, and the decrease in immunizations. In each of the above examples, the problem is caused by ICE's behavior. They view county points of service as target-rich environments, which denies due process to many of our neighbors. The challenge is to find solutions that protect due process, deliver services and protections while not exposing the immigrant population to unconstitutional action by ICE. The toolkit of solutions could include enhanced rights education, a bookmobile service approach where services and legal protections are taken to the community, offering alternative egress options from county offices providing critical services, providing non-traditional hours of operation, partnering with religious and social justice organizations already established in the community to assist both um, intake and service delivery at a wide range of locations. Finally, it was painfully clear from your policy session that all elected officials are not on the same page or have the same commitment to due process. We commend the Sheriff's Office for recognizing the unique position of the county in regards to the Olivares Clackamas County uh, county lawsuit. We applaud the work of those offices under board supervision and the board members themselves for understanding that silence is the moral equivalent of consent. In these unusual times, every citizen is obligated to stand up, lend their voice to a growing chorus across the country calling for justice, fairness, and above all, due process for all residents. Doing the right thing is rarely easy and is often risky. You can count on this party and our members to support you as you move forward to defend the Constitution, Oregon law, and guard against the abuse of our friends and neighbors. 
Should the board decide to seek additional uh, public input or involvement, we stand ready to assist in any way we can. Once again, thank you for addressing this important issue and difficult issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ken, did you had some statistics this morning if you feel comfortable in giving those? Appreciate it. I'll be happy to. Um, just in speaking to the, the issue of um, um, inequitable enforcement, just a couple of numbers. I'd mentioned the other day that about 40% of the people that are in the country uh, illegally uh, are here because of uh, overstaying their visas. I haven't had time to look at every country in the world, but uh, I've had some help in the research and just looking at our neighbors to the north and our neighbors to the south. <clears throat> 93,000 Canadians overstay their visas every year. 42,114 Mexicans overstay their visas every year. And yet, based on deportations, only 1% of Canadians are deported. That's about 646 people. 12% of Hispanic or Mexicans are deported, which strikes me as a um, very discriminatory process. Um, as someone who worked in law enforcement for my career, Due process, in my opinion, is the single most important aspect of what government does in its interaction with its citizens. And if that, or its residents, if that process is not properly followed, trust in government is destroyed. So to me, it is absolutely critical that due process be followed. If an individual is here illegally and has committed a crime, uh, above and beyond that, that warrants their deportation, we have a system known as go to a judge and get a warrant. And it's that simple. And anything less than that, in my opinion, is not acceptable. Thank you. Great. William? Um, yes, I'd just like to add two points to um, Peter's testimony. Uh, on your Tuesday work session, I think there was a gap. Um, there was much discussion about the uh, intimidation this community feels in accessing county services. Um, as a former labor market economist for the state of Oregon, uh, there is an equal gap in their access to labor market protection. Um, I did a, a research of Bo a Bureau of Labor and Industry final orders for 2016 year to date on theft, overtime, minimum wage, uh, prevailing wage, and failure to pay violations of the workers who were victimized during that period of time that Bowley was able to deal with, 21% of those workers were Hispanic. The Hispanic labor force participation rate is 6.6%. So they are grossly over victimized in the labor market as well as for county services. Uh, secondly, um, Peter listed a number of things that the county could take on to help this population. I would like to suggest one possible other and it comes from the undersheriff saying that we have a special obligation as a defendant in the landmark lawsuit, and that is that the county could uh, seek partnership with the governor and or the appropriate state agency to develop a pilot pro project in Clackamas County to figure out how to enforce 181A820. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there is no formalized enforcement of that order, and there is clearly violation. Um, lastly, and in closing, um, as a lifelong trade unionist, uh, we have a phrase, justice delayed is justice denied. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner I, I do Savas. have copies of our resolution. If sure. I Can we also get copies of your, do you have written testimony? I, I, he does. I can send you. Oh, that'd be great. Commissioner Savas. Yeah, I just want to... Um, so I can get our guest attention here. Um, perhaps not. Um, yeah, I just wanted just to convey that if you have, and I kind of expressed this uh, at Tuesday's work session and a work session prior to that even, that if you've got any, and I heard of one, uh, but if you've got any examples, uh, real life cases of that taking place in Clackamas County, my goal is to get to the bottom of it and make sure that due process is served and, um, and so I think that's really, really important that we know what's happening here in our county because we're here. Um, it's our role, we're elected, it's our capacity. Um, so I'm all for that. I'd also love to talk with you further actually about some other issues in which I think there has been um, some disparity in how different populations, uh, disadvantaged populations are being treated when it comes to housing. 
Um, so, you know, this is also a very important thing I'm pretty passionate about. So I want to make sure that what we can do is what we can do within our boundaries and our jurisdictions, whether that's the courts or whether that's the sheriff's office or whether, however that's done. But I want to make sure it's something we can touch and affect um, in, in a positive way. And the same, sh make sure, of course, that, that both the sheriffs and the courthouses can do, do, dust, do justice where it, it needs to be served, that people feel safe um, in, in many aspects. But uh, please, any of, those, any of those real life situations that we have, if you could make sure that those are conveyed to us, uh, each of us, all five of us, um, as well as maybe setting up a meeting to talk about some of our uh, dis disadvantaged situations as it, as it takes place in regards to housing. Absolutely, well. we're more than willing to do that, and we're more than willing to meet and discuss further. This is an important issue to our to our membership. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, uh, Francisco and Andrea. Thank you for coming today. Thanks for having us. Um, Members of the Clackamas County Commission and Chair Bernard, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Andrea Williams. I'm the Executive Director of CAUSA, which is a nonprofit organization that has worked to improve the lives of Latino immigrants and their families for over 20 years. I also happen to be a sort of new Clackamas County resident. I just recently bought a house in Oak Grove, and I love it. It's great. <laughs> um, so I'm here both in my professional and in my personal capacity to request um, the Clackamas County Commission to consider taking one step um, towards what the previous testifiers mentioned um, in passing something we call an inclusivity resolution. And I just passed out a copy of our model resolution that was put together by several attorneys. Um, it's a statement of support for the county's diverse communities, um, but it also clarifies the county's role in regards to immigration enforcement. Inclusivity resolutions have now passed in 10 cities, including, including uh, Wilsonville just recently, and places like Monmouth, McMinnville, Newburgh, and Salem. Um, this, these city councils have passed these resolutions in recognition that it's an uncertain time for immigrant families, families who are really um, integral part of our culture and our e economy here in Oregon. Uh, many have been afraid of taking their children to school um, going to doctor's appointments, carrying out basic daily activities, um, and even visiting local government buildings like courthouses. Um, indeed, there are actual real life examples, as um, Commissioner Savas just said and requested. Um, a few weeks ago, ICE arrested a father of a three-year-old girl outside the county courthouse in Oregon City, right here in this city. He was simply there to um, proceed with his divorce filing. Um, so he was not there for a criminal activity, he was there to simply move forward on his divorce. And it's things like that that um, really prevent people from interacting with the government and the courthouse is a really critical thing for a lot of different reasons. Um, so, you know, I would say that while there's very little the county can do to get in the way of ICE, um, it is important for the functioning of the county that families won't be under threat of deportation for simply calling the sheriff um, or even using uh, mental health care services, for example. Um, so it's really important that families hear loud and clear from the county uh, what the policy is um, and that they're not using local government resources to enforce federal immigration law or you know, basically doing the federal government's job. Um, and we can make sure um, one step towards doing that is by passing this resolution. There's certainly many other things that can be done. Um, I'll conclude there, but I just want to say we'd love to continue working with you all and considering this resolution. Thank you. Great, thank you, and we'll have our county council take a look at it. Commissioner Schrader. So one of the issues that came up at our work session the other day was the notion of immigration reform. Did, and I was just looking up your organization here. Mm -hmm. I wish you had been around in the early 80s, but you weren't. So, But my question is, so what are you folks doing to uh, move along uh, real immigration reform at the federal level that will help 
allay all of this nonsense. That's right. Ultimately, the solution lies with Congress, and we have advocated for an immigration reform bill for over a decade. <laughs> it's been a long haul on that, and we got really close in 2013. Um, it resulted in the creation of Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, created by President Obama to, to protect undocumented youth. Um, but unfortunately, um, you know, we continue to advocate for immigration reform, but unfortunately a lot of what we're doing is defending against um, thing, policies that we think are bad ideas, such as only focusing on enforcement and not even considering a path to citizenship for the 11 million undocumented people who are here um, and the 140,000 that are here in Oregon. So um, politically it's really bleak. <laughs> we don't quite have the votes and we haven't had the votes in Congress for a long time. Um, and unfortunately, but also no pressure, I do think that a lot of the work and impact we can make lies locally, um, at the city level, at the county level, at the state level, which is why we've doubled down on um, working with the governor to pass that executive order she issued to extend, expand um, ORS 181A820, um, and uh, want to continue working with counties and cities to figure out how else we can support our communities here. Well, thank you for that. And if you've got, um, I, I don't have anything in front of me. If you have information on your pathways to citizenship, I would really be interested in well, looking sure. at yeah, that. Yeah, I can show you former level. bills that we've supported. Absolutely. Okay, that, would be, that would be great. And uh, if you can email me or somehow get me those documents, that would be fabulous. I can thank you. That. Thank you. Ken? You know, I was thinking about your presentation and, and realizing that there's a, there may be folks with a, a misconception out there about the issue of fear in the community. So I, I wanted to set something straight. Everybody who is afraid of um, ICE and these, these uh, enforcement issues is not here illegally. There are people who are afraid because they're afraid they may be mistaken for somebody who's here illegally and thereby deported unfairly. They may have someone close to them, either in their family or friends circle, that might be here illegally but not them, and they're afraid that exposure through them could get somebody else in trouble. So it isn't as if every single person who is, who is of Hispanic descent or any other uh, um, ethnic group uh, is here illegally and therefore they, you know, ha they have no rights or something to that effect. They're also concerned about their friends, their neighbors, and their families. And then I would uh, point out um, there's been a Supreme Court case that's, I think, been uh, reaffirmed several different times. Correct me if I'm wrong. But it uh, basically says that any person here in the United States is entitled to due process. It does not say every citizen. It says every person. So I'm, I don't believe I'm incorrect on that. And I see our county council nodding his head. So I think I got that one right. Thank you. Great. Francisco? Thank you, Chair Bernard. Thank you, Commissioners, for the opportunity to testify on uh, this wonderful idea of declaring uh, Clackamas a sanctuary uh, city. My name is Francisco. I'm original from El Salvador. I've been here in the United States for over 21 years. Um, in 2014, I, I started getting harassed by ICE after Sheriff from Clackamas County, share information with us, including my name, um, date of birth, uh, address, and my country of origin. They show up at my house trying to take me in custody uh, without any warrant, not even that their um, illegal uh, uh, orders that they carry to detain people unlawfully. When I say Sheriff Department shared that information, it's because uh, the district attorney responded through an email uh, when we asked why they collude with ICE to take me in custody. His answer was, we do not collude with ICE. We work with ICE. That's dangerous for our community. My son, Dennis Moises, returned to El Salvador because he was afraid of being detained and put it in jail for over 20 years like they was threatening me. He ended up getting shot 16 times with uh, M16 and 
three bullets from a nine millimeter. That's what we are doing when we deporting people to a dangerous country like El Salvador. I'm not here to create trouble, to steal, to shoot people or rape a woman. I'm here to work with my community, to pay my taxes and help with the economy of this country. This is my home. And I really appreciate that uh, we think more toward passing resolution to protect our immigrant community instead of allowing our local authorities to collude with ICE and taking in custody. People who deserve to be joined that freedom like any human being deserve. The United States is have a constitutional law and we should all respect the law. I immigrate and I didn't choose to immigrate to this country. I was forced to do it. And if we wanna look back a little bit in the history, United States have a lot of responsible for what happened in my small country of El Salvador. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming today and providing voice. Um, so 2014, uh, I imagine a lot has changed since then. Uh, one of the, our problems is that everyone who has, has been in our jail is on the web. And uh, evidently there is an effort on ICE to look at those. And they can tell when people get out. Um, and as far as I know, I think the sheriff, the jail said they don't, they don't call people and say they're getting out. Uh, it's just on the web and they can figure it out. They kind of watch for it. Um, but uh, I just appreciate uh, your voice today, you know, telling us how it really is. And uh, thank you very much. I do want to say that I've been in, in Oregon City courtrooms twice just to witness how ICE is working. ICE is going into courtrooms and sitting beside the people who's waiting for their turn to, um, um, for court hearing, and eyes are taking them out of the room, asking them to please stand, bow out, to, just to talk, and don't make noise so you can be charged for disorder conduct in courtrooms. <laughs> That's how they do it in Clackamas. And we're not even talking about people who have been convicted of any, any crime, not even in jail. This is prior to all of that, so this is really worrisome. Well, that, that's different from what we heard yesterday, that uh, mm -hmm. they weren't arresting people. Well, they're, maybe they're not arresting them, but they're taking them out. So we just them. recently heard from the ICE director in Oregon that their policies have changed um, due to the president's executive order that now um, is now having an impact, and they're starting to change their policies. So it just makes more urgent um, looking at what the county can do to ensure that people can carry out their processes through the courts especially. Well, I'd love to sit down and talk, talk with you because um, there isn't a heck of a lot the county could do. Uh, and that's one of our big concerns is that we don't want uh, folks to think that there is a lot we can do. Uh, we can't stop them. That's right. We, we have some ideas. Okay, well great, so I'd talk. love to talk to you. Just get a hold of my office and we can get together. Sonia? Thank you. Yeah, so I also want to thank everyone for coming and speaking today. And Chair Bernard is right. We don't have jurisdiction over the federal government. We can't force the federal government to do or not to do anything. But what we can do as a local government and as the elected officials that are closest to the people is listen to everyone who lives in Clackamas County and to we have a voice. We have a voice to our congressional delegation. We have a voice where we can articulate what is happening in our community and communicate that to our federal delegation. And I think what you're doing by connecting with local communities across the state and across the country is absolutely essential because we have the stories and it's very important that we communicate what is actually happening. So I wanna say thank you. I'm right alongside with Commissioner Schrader. I know this, all of this commission is very concerned about immigration reform and that we want to um, somehow take these collective stories and communicate 
what needs to happen because everyone who lives in our community is important to us. So thank you so much. Commissioner Savas. I just want to say, uh, if, if you don't mind, is it okay if I reach out to you, you cut your contact information? Okay. Absolutely. And I think Ken has um, our emails too. So. I do. Appreciate you coming forward. And um, as, a, as a grandchild of four grandparents who were forced out of their country, who immigrated here in the 1900s, uh, early 1900s, I, I under, can understand and, um, you know, the plight and especially um, the folks in your country that are going through uh, a, a lot of pain. So um, thanks again for sharing your story. Thank you. Great. Uh, Ken? I'm brief on this one. Um, I agree there's not a lot proactively that we can do, but there are things that we do not have to do. And I think that probably is where we may have the most effect in terms of assisting the immigrant community. And I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I just want to just close. I mean, I think our, our, that lawsuit with regard to that one person we held for 18 hours, um, apparently, um, do, a, do an ICE detainer um, was a representation that due process does work in this country because we lost that lawsuit for those 18 hours. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Commissioner Schrader. I just want to uh, mention that what I know about El Salvador because I remember in the 80s, um, Archbishop... Oscar Romero was actually very active and he was actually assassinated uh, in his church because it was mass in his chapel of the Hospital of Divine Providence. He was a um, spokesperson against poverty, social injustice, assassinations, and tortured. And I think he was recently beatified by Pope Francis because he is now considered um, one of the martyrs of the 20th century, and he was very active in speaking against the injustices of uh, that. And I only mention that because, uh, well, my heritage is Catholic, it's Italian Catholic, uh, but um, I remember admiring him, and I'm very glad that uh, he has now risen to the status of someone internationally recognized as a champion for justice. Okay, next up, Alberto and uh, Mr. Brainerd. Are we? You're Mr. Brainerd, you're Alberto? Go ahead, take a seat. <laughs> it's, go ahead. Per it's perfectly safe. Whoever wants to go first. <laughs> well, I can go first. I, I don't know how much you're saying. Same topic. I can see this is my first time in front of the commission here. Uh, my name is Brainerd Brower. I'm a citizen of uh, Oregon City, but a Redland community. Um, I can see there's a, a lot of important topics in front of you today. Uh, I have a handout. I'm not going to read it to you. It's kind of lengthy, you know, as no. You know. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just had some, a summary of some detail. You know, I've had, uh, you know, as I uh, I think Commissioner Bernard is aware, a good cooperation from the county in looking at this matter. And the matter is um, my intersection, my main intersection of Redland, of Redland Road and Fisher's Mill um, <laughs> has been a dangerous location for a long time. We, various citizens have lobbied for speed reductions all the way down to school zones for many, many years. And there's been, you know, extensive attempts at doing that. Um, and it's and it's never gone anywhere. Um, and one of the rationales, at least by one of the elders in the community has said, is that we haven't had any deaths. So in the last six months, we've had um, one fatality. And while I was um, out of town, I don't know, a month or so back, um, there was another, but this was a serious class A you know, um, near fatality. Um, and that would have been a fatality if it wasn't for, and really the emergency response people deserve tremendous credit because everything worked. They got there in time, they took the top off a car, um, a life flight was available, they were there and it was still very touch and go. So I, I, I'm not certain of the, of, the, um, of the expectation on the person, but I believe they're gonna make a rec full recovery. That's what I heard through one, one path. Um, and, um, I mean, I have damage to my property that I should be working on trying to recover insurance stuff on, but I'm doing everything I can in my good conscience to at least present this topic 
the next step is really to get the community voice into the picture. Um, but maybe it's so obvious that we can find a path. I understand there's going to be a speed study started next week. Um, I'm really asking the commission for transparency, first of all, to be aware of it. Um, I am asking the commission to support the process of proposing to ODOT that the speed be reduced. I think a reasonable level is 35 miles an hour. It was actually first proposed um, by the battalion chief who lives out in our area um, a couple years ago for a shorter area than the current speed zone. And the definition here shows how it fits the ORS, the OARs. I've done my research at this point, and I think I have a proposal. So, so thank you for your attention on it. Thank you, and I am familiar, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, I don't see why we as a commission wouldn't support it. I just wanted to mention that on Monday of next week, three different locations on Redland Road within the current 45 mile per hour zone would have, will have counters. Uh, gathering volume, speed data, and three different locations will provide us with a profile of speed near each end of the current zone and at the middle so we can uh, see the speed pattern. And my suggestion yesterday is call your friends and have them drive slow <laughs> down uh, Redland Road. But there, it's going to have to be a big crowd. And it's going to have to be 24 hours a day. Yeah. I I mentioned also to you that when I was mayor of Milwaukee, Lake Road, we tried and tried and finally got uh, ODOT to lower it because. And you mentioned some stuff in here which I need to read up on a little bit about where we have more flexibility than is suggested, and, yeah. but we'll take a look at it. Yeah, I mean, if I can add, I mean, my research with ODOT is that, I mean, first of all, they seem to have a pretty, uh, quite a bit of flexibility in their, in their uh, OARs. Um, they, you, we can also, as a county, go to, go back to ODOT and, and propose, a, you know, a, um, whatever, the, the go, go in front of the board there, the traffic safety board, you know, and ask for a, it to happen anyway. One of the challenges with this three speed zone check is that we have a downhill, serious downhill going into Redland. Yep. And that has a natural tendency of making the speeds look higher than, than would be appropriate or otherwise natural. So it's, a ch it's probably been the biggest challenge. Yeah, I just want to add your characterization of ODOT being flexible is very different from mine. <laughs> well, I'm only going by speaking to one person and reading the official regulations. Yeah. So, thank yeah. you. Obviously, I don't have the experience. <laughs> <laughs> Ken? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, actually, I've been driving that direction a lot lately. Uh, been through that intersection more times than I can count, um, going different places in rural areas. And uh, I agree with your assessment personally about uh, the risk that's there trying to get onto Redland Road coming in from um, the Oregon City area and getting ready to make that hook over to Fisher's Mill and the traffic is coming in there at 50, 55 miles an hour. It's, it's a, a dangerous spot and a slowdown is a good idea. Yeah, Hopefully it it, it just will, seems so obvious. So. Yeah. It, <laughs> you drive it a few times and you'll find out how obvious it is, no question about it. Yeah. Be there and watch it, and you just you see all these close calls, and it's just kind of scary. Roberto, I mean Alberto, thank uh, you for coming today. Thank you, uh, Chair Bernard, County Commissioners. My name is uh, Alberto Moreno. I am the governor appointed chair for the Commission on Hispanic Affairs for the State of Oregon. Uh, as you know, there are half a million Latinos uh, in Oregon. We are Oregon's teachers her doctors, her farm workers, her restaurant and hotel workers. We make meaningful contributions to the state, to her counties, <coughs> to, to her cities. In 2007, Latino-owned businesses had a record of 1,663,452,000 in receipts. In Oregon, Latinos had purchasing power of 9.2 billion in 2014 a 660 percent increase from 1990. There are 29,138 Latinos who live, pray, and work in Clackamas County alone. And you have 
12,334 migrant and seasonal farm workers in your county. I know because I commissioned the Oregon enumeration study that it tells us so. Farm workers who are integral to generating over $5.5 billion in annual agricultural activity in Oregon. While it is clear we make meaningful contributions and serve as the backbone for a multitude of industries, we do not always share equally in Oregon's prosperity nor do we enjoy the same protection of law. This is especially true for undocumented workers and families in Oregon and in Clackamas County. Undocumented workers who, according to the Oregon Center for Public Policy, paid $181 million in state taxes last year alone. Undocumented families who rent, who buy homes, and who shop in Clackamas County. But because of federal immigration, I want to underscore federal immigration enforcement, our communities do not feel safe. Our families fear going to school, to work, even to pray. Domestic violence victims, as you have heard, are afraid to come forward, are afraid to go out to buy groceries, to take their children to get immunized, are afraid to take their children to school. We have become afraid. We become afraid of our county workers, of our schools, of our courthouses, of any and all government agencies. And soon, soon something will start to happen in Clackamas County. Soon we will stop purchasing. Soon we will stop spending $9.2 billion. Soon we will stop shopping for groceries, for clothing, for cars, for houses. Soon crops will rot on the vine. There will be no one to tend our Christmas tree farms which are numerous in Clackamas County, our nurseries, no bus boys or dishwashers for our restaurants, no hotel workers to make our beds, no construction workers to mend our roads, to work cheaply on our new roofs. That is why we need to make Clackamas County an inclusive community, to make meaningful policy changes which restrict any county employee from collaborating with federal immigration enforcement reminding us that immigration enforcement is a federal function. And as such, we invite you to prohibit the use of any county dollars for any kind of immigration enforcement or collaboration. I know I'm out of time and want to thank you for your consideration of this important issue. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And by the way, we do not spend any county resources or money to help immigration. That's the law, and we are following the law. So thank you very much for coming. And it'd be great. Uh, do you have a website that we could take a peek and get some of those facts? I was just going to say, I'd like yeah. to get that information. Can you give us, email us your all those numbers. I tried to write them down, and I didn't get all that I wanted. And, and I apologize. I ran out of time. I even have more data to share with you. <laughs> we want we your data. Look. Yes. And, and I'm happy to email my testimony to Chair, uh, I'm sorry, Commissioner, apologies, Chair Bernard, <laughs> to Commissioner I'll Humphrey's see to that my colleagues get it. No problem. Wonderful. Thank you for your Thank time. you very much. Thanks. Great. Thank you for coming. Um, the next item on the agenda, we have a few public hearings, and uh, I assume we're going to announce we're pulling one and amending the other. That, that's, that, is the, uh, that is the case, and I'll, I'll leave that to uh, uh, County Council Stephen Madcor to explain uh, for you. But we, we will be pulling the third item on our uh, second reading of three ordinances, and that's the item related to Chapter 8.02, transient room tax, uh, that's going to be rescheduled to June the 15th uh, for consideration at that time. So we do have then a second reading of um, an ordinance uh, to amendment to Title III regarding elections uh, and also second reading of an ordinance uh, involving amendments to Chapter 6.06, .06, Park Rules and Declaring an Emergency in that particular item it also has some changes pending for it. Uh, so Chair Bernard, Council, I, we'll I'm going to have to apologize. I have to be somewhere in about 20 minutes. So okay. I'm going to step out and... $5 fine. The, yeah, we'll $5 fine. I know you will, colleagues will take care of it, and I've given Commissioner Savas the arts and culture activities. All right, thank you. Okay, thank Drive you. safe. I will.
Good morning, Commissioners. Stephen Madcore, County Council. We initially had three public hearings scheduled for you this morning. As Administrator Krupp mentioned, we are pulling one, uh, continuing it on June 15th. That is with the uh, transient room uh, lodging tax ordinance amendments. We are going to continue with two. The first one, we're going to do them individually. The first one is Chapter 3 of our code. Existing as Chapter 3.01, it concerns the clerk's office. We are striking that chapter in its entirety. It concerns referendum and initiatives. That is uh, inconsistent with state law. State law controls that entire process, so we're striking what we have and resorting to the process set forth in the ORS. That is one provision that we're doing. We are also adding two separate sections. One is 3.04, which concerns a jurisdiction's requirement to file boundary changes with the clerk to maintain the accuracy of jurisdictional boundaries and the voter rolls and things along those lines. Uh, Clackamas Water District had some issues, Oregon City, so it's really a uh, ensuring that we have the most recent uh, voter and district boundary data. The second one is 3.05, which is basically just codifying a prior board order about the qualifications for the justice of the peace to serve at justice court. It has to be a member in good standing of the Oregon State Bar and a few other criteria. That was not in our code. It was in a board order when it established justice court. So we are incorporating that into our code itself. So two, um, striking the one provision 301, adding 34 and adding 35. And I'm here to answer any questions the board might have with those chapter amendments no questions but we're gonna do one motion on two uh, the, the parks ones included in that motion yes, that will be second we'll take chapter three first we're gonna do the reading first and then we're gonna do the uh, the adoption of that and then we will go to um, chapter six the parks district okay I, I on the script I put that we'll read both of the ordinances by title only with one motion well we can just do two I mean it's uh, so first I'll open the public hearing ask if anyone would like to testify on this matter the huge crowd we have uh, don't rush up here all at once <laughs> I'll close the public portion and um, got to make sure I know what I'm asking close the public portion ask the, the read the motion so I'll, I, I move to read ordinance th 3-2017 by title only. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Oh, uh, is there a second? I'll second. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded to read uh, ordinance number 03-2017 by title only. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Uh, motion carries 4-0. Uh, Mary? Okay. Okay, ordinance number 03-2017, an ordinance amending Cha Clackamas County Code Title III elections. And we need to vote on that, right? Yes. yes okay, uh, any further questions? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries 4-0. And entertain a motion to read Oh, wait, no, you got it. Nope, us. I'm going to give you a little intro on the next item, and that's going to be ordinance number 04 2017. And you have this concerns park rules. You heard this on April 13th, and this is the one where it is clearing house or housekeeping of sorts on park rules. It also prohibited nudity in our parks. It also proposed a prohibition on drones in our parks, and that is in the current draft that you have before you, but we are recommending that we strike the proposed prohibition on drones and be silent on it. The reason being is because the legislature has enacted some legislation concerning unmanned aerial aircraft, which would arguably conflict with this and preempt local jurisdictions from regulating in drones. So our recommendation is that we Visit page 6 of 11 in your packet, which is subsection F, where it says fireworks, weapons, and drones, strike and drones, and in front of weapons, add and. So we'll say fireworks and weapons, striking and drones, and we go down to sub 5 and strike that proposed section in its entirety. 
where it says no person shall operate in unmanned aerial aircraft such as a drone. So we had proposed restricting drones and we are now proposing that you strike that prohibition. So drones arguably could be allowed but they would be dictated by state law not by county law. That is the only change we are proposing with this. We've run it by the guys in uh, parks and they agree with our recommendations. And I'm here to answer any questions that you might have with that. Just that when we make the motion, we'll have to make note of that. When you make the motion, I have some language which would be, I move we adopt with today's proposed changes, ordinance number, and I can give you that script. That is, of course, if this board is in agreement with the recommendations. Okay, Commissioner Savas. I'm struggling with this one. Um, so I don't understand why we cannot restrict on county property, a park, why we cannot restrict the use of drones. And granted, I understand that, you know, I mean, there's a privacy issue. So, um, so what we're saying basically is what? That someone could come to a county park and fly a drone. Is that what we're saying? We are not saying that. We are saying that the state has legislated to such an extent in this area of law that it is preempted. County authority generally is over matters of county concern, but for areas of law that the state has legislated so heavily that it is preempted. In the section that we are re resorting to is ORS 3 or 837, and it essentially says that no local government may enact an ordinance or resolution that regulates the ownership or operation of unmanned aircraft systems. And it's my office's assessment that prohibiting drones on county land is a regulation regulating the operation of an unmanned aircraft. So what it says here is that the state legislation in that area. So this section 837, legislates on what the sheriffs or law enforcement can use with drones. They can use it for crime scene investigation. They can use it for search and rescue. They can use it for training. They cannot use it for establishing probable cause or reasonable suspicion. It also sets forth penalties of somebody who uses a drone over your personal property. There is a civil penalty associated with that as well. So if somebody were to use a drone over county property and the county were to object, there would be civil penalty associated with that person's unauthorized continued use of that drone over county property. So can you maybe elaborate on that, on that aspect of it? What is the state law? I mean, and who enforces that? Are, are, be, are, are, can, can county employees enforce that at the county park? Can the sheriff's office enforce that? Because we have gotten ourselves tied, uh, um, um, and for example, marijuana regulation, okay? It's state law. You can do this, you can do that, but we, we, can't, we can't enforce it because it's not clear. So is it ambiguous as well as who enforces that? If you say you can't use that, if state law says you cannot enforce it, or no, you, no if the state law says you cannot regulate it, does it clearly say that we can enforce state law? No, it does not. That's, Jurisdiction that, is that, with that, the Oregon my, Aviation Agency. That, that's my difficulty with it. So, so, so someone can come to the park and fly a drone. They're violating state law, but we can't enforce it. Is that, that's what we're saying. No, there would be potential civil penalties for it, though. If somebody were to civil, but but I'm saying us, the county, we can't enforce it. It's a civil. It's not. It's not. We can't enforce a civil. There is nothing in. I haven't read anything in the code in the, the state statute. This is new legislation from Salem, and I haven't read anything saying that it's going to be criminal sanction for flying a drone. There might be FAA requirements. There are, but there might be FAA penalties and also Oregon uh, aviation penalties. But in terms of county folks enforcing something, um, I would think not. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing to enforce. We, we're just not prohibiting it. Correct. That's the prohibition. I don't want us to get necessarily, um, this happened when we did the secondhand pawn shop thing about regulating the sale of firearms. There's a hook in state law saying county jurisdictions can't regulate the secondhand sale of firearms. Cities can, but counties can't. So that's another issue that the state has legislated so broadly and that counties are essentially prohibited from 
legislating in an area that conflicts with state law. And it's called preemption, it's a legal doctrine, and that's what this section clearly says. So, I mean, we can revisit it, I just recommend not including it at this point because it is in clear conflict with state law. I was more worried you were going to amend the nudity part. Maybe Ken wants to pull that one out. Yeah. Ken? <laughs> Why does everybody look at me when it comes down to that one? <laughs> uh, I, I did have a question. Um, so the, the state law preempts and says that uh, we can't prohibit drones in a park. Can we in any way, shape, or form regulate time, place, and manner? Those are usually restricted to zoning and land use, but I think we will be able to regulate them if we want to. We just want to do it in a little bit more of a careful, methodical manner. We're not saying we're not going to revisit this. There's, this there's, language there's, is, there's the real answer. This right. language is too broad right now as presented. And yeah, yeah. so no, we're, we're happy to do it. We just don't want to put it out there and have to, to pull it back again. It's best just to pull it right now. Sort of like the Supreme Court's decision on, on the, the prohibition of weapons in the Washington, D.C. It was, you couldn't have one, period. And the court ruled that is too broad. You can't prohibit people from owning a weapon in Washington, D.C., but you can do reasonable regulation. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's kind of the same principle. Yep. No, we will definitely, we're not abandoning this entirely. We will revisit it. We just don't want to endorse uh, this language at this time. Okay. <laughs> but enforcement of time, place, manner would be very difficult. Well, uh, with that, uh, it, let me see. So what's your uh, recommended motion, or is that the after? Which would say, I move we adopt with today's proposed changes, ordinance number 042017, amending Clackamas County Code Chapter 6.06, .06, park rules, and declaring an emergency. Okay, but first we need to read it by title only. And first we need to open the public hearing. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'd like to open the public hearing on 04-2017. Anyone wishing to testify on that matter? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing and uh, entertain a motion to read by title only first, I would think. I move we adopt with today's proposed changes. Okay. We no. Have to read no. First we got to do the I'm title. sorry, I move we adopt ordinance number... Zero no. four. No. No, I need to move to read the uh, zero four two zero one seven by title only. I, I apologize, Mr. Madcourt handed me something, and I assumed, but that was for later. Yes. If you'd like, I have it here in front of me. We can move on. <laughs> I move Sorry. to read ordinance zero four dash two zero one seven by title only. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. <laughs> It's been moved and second to read ordinance number 04-2017 by title only. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Almost forgot to vote. All right, Mary. Okay, ordinance number 04-2017, an ordinance amending Clackamas County Code Chapter 6.06, .06, Park Rules, and Declaring an Emergency. Okay, so in this case, I'll entertain a motion to adopt ordinance 04-2017 as amended. I move we adopt with today's proposed changes ordinance number 04-2017 amending Clackamas County Code Chapter 6.06 .06, Park Rules and Declaring an Emergency. Second. I usually read it back, but since it's not in front of me, um, uh, motion's been to. Um, yeah, and seconded. I, I always like. I always like to read it back. That was something they taught us at County College. Okay, read. Uh, uh, it's read. been moved and seconded to adopt, with today's proposed changes, ordinance number zero four dash two zero one seven, amending Clackamas County Code Chapter six point zero six, Park Rules and Declaring Emergency. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, motion passes for zero. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank uh, the clerk of the board for uh, getting us squared away on exactly how to follow this process. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, but I messed up in the first place. That's okay. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, um, so, yeah. I, did, I wanted to back up for a moment, if I may, Mr. Chairman. There was a typo on Chapter 3.05 um, elections to hold the Office of Justice of the Peace. And 
it says there loss of membership, lapse of membership, of suspension of membership. It meant or suspension of membership. And just so that there wouldn't be any syntax confusion in the future, we might want to make sure that that's corrected. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so um, since we removed uh, ordinance number 05-2017 and set a specific date, we're going to move on to the next public hearing, uh, board order approving. Uh, Don, why don't you go ahead? Certainly, yeah. So th <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a public hearing to consider a board order. Uh, to approve the Americans with Disabilities Act Transition Plan for Public Rights of Way. I'm going to ask Mr. Mike Besner to come up to the dais to uh, uh, talk about this item with you. Thank you. Do I? Uh, Com Commissioner Fisher will be right back. So I am here today um, to recommend you approve the resolution before you to adopt uh, Department of Transportation and Development's proposed um, transition plan for the American, Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so what is it? Basically, um, the county, it's a federal requirement under the ADA Act, which was passed in 1990, that we have a transition plan which will help us get from get complete compliance with our curb ramps, and that's what we're here to talk about today, curb ramps. 85% um, of our curb ramps, or 4,000 of them, were built before the ADA was passed in 1990. Um, and private groups can take legal action against a government entity to gain compliance. It's not just the law, though. It's also the right thing to do. Um, there's a need for Clackamas County residents. About one-eighth of our residents actually have a disability. Um, so the plan uh, basically paves the way for, for those um, folks to be able to get around the community. To develop the plan, we took, took a lot of work. We evaluated over 4,700 curb ramps and 69 traffic signals. Um, we found that most of them needed improvements to get compliance. And again, 85% were built before the law existed, and there actually were standards. Um, unfortunately, this is consistent with other agencies around the state as well. We're all working on it. Um, it is our responsibility to fix those that predate the ADA. It, it's, uh, we do have to go back no matter when they were built. So we sought input from those with disabilities around Clackamas County and asked them, what are your priorities for these improvements? And they came back with, we want the busiest roads first. So um, we basically taken that to mean our arterials and collectors. And again, arterials and collectors are technical terms. Um, it's how we classify our roads. Arterials are, generally speaking, our most heavily, heavily traveled. Collectors are in the middle, and then local roads are, are the lowest. Um, so the schedule for coming up with the, to, to complete these, it's obviously dependent on funding. And all we have in transportation is our road fund. Um, but we are starting already. Um, we have a project already this summer that's consistent with the plan. On Oak Grove Boulevard, we're going to improve 15 to 20 um, curb ramps that currently don't meet ADA. It was a high priority location, and also we did an analysis and showed there were a lot of people that needed it, a lot of people with disabilities in the area, which is another thing we're going to use is what the community need is in that area. Um, at our current funding levels, through capital projects, through extra money, with, which is just ADA projects, through development coming in and fixing ramps, um, our highest priority locations, or the arterials, would take about 12 and a half years. Um, so we can ask, is that a reasonable time frame, a reasonable risk? And what we can look at is what other agencies who have actually had lawsuits filed recently, how have they... What were they compelled to do? And ODOT recently settled one just in November or December um, where they agreed to fix their state highways, which are like our arterials, within 15 years. So with our arterials, we're actually going to do a little bit better than, than ODOT. Um, ben settled a lawsuit back in 04 that required them to upgrade everything that they had built since 1992, so a much smaller amount, and that's what their settlement was. So. I feel pretty comfortable with our plan that we're, we're, we're doing as good or better than these other agencies and what their settlements were with the groups that had, that had um, brought lawsuits. 
Our second priority locations would be the collector streets. Um, that would take about another 10 years um, after that um, to get those done. Um, commitment of additional funds obviously would allow us to change the timeline somewhat. You know, we are a little constricted with um, our ability to put work out and the number of contractors available. I guarantee if we put out a contract for 4,000 ramp upgrades, we would not have a contractor with the capacity to do it. So you can only do these so often. Um, but if there's a statewide transportation bill passed that we're all hoping will, will occur, we can revisit the timelines. Um, but in any event, this plan is our roadmap to success. It's our roadmap to completion, and it will work in any funding scenario. It's just, you know, it's the way we're going to prioritize the improvements. So with that, we do recommend you approve the resolution and um, see if you have any questions. Well, one, one, one comment is uh, we're approving the ADA transition plan for public right-of-way, but we could specifically state that uh, the, the schedule of replacement, um, the schedule uh, and budget for removal of barriers to ADA accessibility uh, may be amended uh, should additional resources uh, be available. Or one of the things that I think we might want to consider when we talk about our vehicle registration fee that we're coming up, we're going to be meeting with the cities on, is, uh, is looking at that possibility of uh, adding a dollar or two to that to help facilitate this. And, and so you have a, a budget figure, an annual budget figure right now. Yeah, we do. Right now we're using $180,000, but the plan actually, on page 22 of the plan, there's uh, some text that we added to address different levels of funding and what different timelines yeah. would be. Yeah, I, I guess it's uh, as presented, and I know we have our issues about maybe seeing a faster time frame for implementation, which I agree with. I think it's a, it's a plan that we're required to have, um, and so it's not really how the implementation of the plan can be accelerated without a change in the plan as I, as yeah, I that's read the true. language. So I, I think I'm comfortable with the language, but I do think it's probably appropriate that we um, say and, and plan for a faster implementation than what the plan states. We could certainly do that with funding. Yep. Commissioner? So just a couple of things. I really appreciate the spirit of this plan, especially the way that people with disabilities are characterized and how they are um, such an important part of our community and acknowledging just the spirit of access and how important that is for everyone in our community. I, um, unfortunately, you know, we had our policy session and I just got the language, I just reviewed it this morning. I still have some concerns about, with additional funding, the best we can do according to this plan is in 26 years, but if we, even with additional funding, it's going to take 54 years. So it's hard for me to support a plan written as is without some sort of qualification about the policy and the values of the board to do things more quickly. Um, so that's just... Oh, you can, yeah, go ahead. And well, I was just going to say, the, the 54 years is actually every single ramp, and that's actually with exactly how we're funding it right now. It's not with additional funding. So that's the $180,000 if we kept that forever until we were finished. And it is also every ramp in our system, um, some of which we're going to determine at the end um, don't need anything necessarily because there's not even a sidewalk there yet, for, for example. So... Um, it actually would be quite a bit shorter. But yeah, the 54 years is simply if we don't do anything differently. Okay, so that, I mean, that's a concern for me because yeah. that's how it's written. So, so like, as Chair Bernard said, some sort of policy direction about changing that I think, I think is important. I do understand that there is a requirement in the plan to have a schedule. So I know that that's a requirement. Um, the other piece that I was concerned about, and I didn't have much time before this meeting, so I tried to reach out to some stakeholders to say, hey, what was your involvement with this plan? And they didn't have involvement with the plan for the, peop the folks that I talked to, but I didn't have a lot of time. So I'm curious, what was your public process? Well, um, we actually did meet with and contact 
um, several groups. So I'd be curious to get the names of the ones that you did. Well, I didn't have much time. So which groups did you connect um, with? Well, Steve Williams, um, who's one of our senior planners, or will come in and he can address that part. Good morning, Steve Williams, uh, Principal Transportation Planner, Department of Transportation and Development. We did a pretty extensive outreach process last year at, at the beginning of the development of this plan. We reached out to um, private organizations within the county and the region that provide services to those with disabilities. We reached out through all of our senior centers uh, we reached out through the Disability Services Advisory Committee, and they actually provided quite a bit of, of input to us. We also met with the Aging Services uh, Council here uh, in the county, uh, and uh, uh, additionally, we met with the um, uh, Developmental Dis Disabilities uh, Services Council and received, uh, did a presentation for them and received their input. That was at the beginning of the process. At the end of the process, uh, we put this product out for review with all of the same groups of folks. Okay, so all of those groups wrote, had a review of this plan? It was submitted to them and they uh, received a, an invitation to submit comments, to contact me, uh, anything like that. Okay. I, yeah, yeah that's I, really I can helpful. add that we did an awful lot of social media. I kept seeing it on my own phone because I follow the county. But, um, yeah, so that's what we did. Okay, well, one of the, in just the short time that I was reaching out to stakeholders, one um, suggestion to the plan was another level of prioritization where if someone lives in a community and they have an access issue that they can, there's a process to bring that to light and have that go higher on the priority list. That's completely reasonable. Yeah, so I mean, so that's just another, what I would like to suggest is just to, um, I think, you know, for you to take this input, for to give me an opportunity to get some further input and work with you and maybe bring it back. Um, not too long, but maybe in a couple weeks if we have time to do that. You guys good with that? Well, I, I was prepared to move forward, quite frankly, um, because flexibility in terms of, of advancing the process um, is simply based on how much money we're able to put forward. If we get money from the state, we can put more money into the project. If we decide in our budget process we want to put more money into it other than the $180,000 a year that we're currently allocating, um, it doesn't strike me as necessary to have um, uh, staff come back. They, the additional funds pr allow them to do what they need to do. Um, when I read the report, I saw that the community was, was clearly um, involved in the process. They prioritized those projects that were the, that would have the greatest impact on their communities. And it looked like within five years, if I remember correctly, the highest priority items would all be done. And I think in another five years, the second highest priority items would all be done. If we simply stayed, or maybe it's 12 and a half years, if we simply, if we simply stayed with $180,000 a year going forward. So I, Speaking for myself, at least, I'm, I'm prepared to, to vote to go forward, get it done, and um, if there's an adjustment in the budget in the future that we need to, to take care of, that would be fine as far as I'm concerned. Just, just to clarify, it's the top three priorities of the arterial. So the top three priorities would be done in 12 and a half years, and then the collectors were four through six. Yeah. Commissioner Savas. Yeah, I, I don't think we're casting anything in stone. I will say that you know, if we are successful at the state level in getting some more transportation funding um, through a transportation bill, that we would be able to prioritize those available dollars that can be allowed to do that just for that purpose. So I'm, I think we have the flexibility to satisfy Commissioner Fisher's concern in how it's implemented and the timing as is currently drafted. So I too, as Commissioner Humberson stated, am prepared to move forward with just putting the plan in place and, um, and then we can deal again with how we implement it and how we fund it because that is really the, the big issue. And going through hearing some presentations from ODOT and some of the transportation committees um, and knowing that every jurisdiction is facing this um, and there's been a lot of attention drawn to this, that um, this is just the beginning of a long, long process. 
Well, uh, let me add that if, if Commissioner Fisher would like to wait a couple of weeks, I'd be happy to support her in this because it isn't, it isn't something we have to do today. There's, only, there's also one other thing that she mentioned is that when we did our retreat, we talked about areas where the greatest poverty is. And uh, while this plan may not address that, that's more of a legislative thing that this commission is saying, we should invest in areas where we haven't invested in the past, uh, that we should focus some of that investment there. So I'm gonna leave it up to you. If you'd like to wait a couple of weeks, I, I'm gonna vote, we'll just uh, move it to another period. Yeah. Yes. Uh um, I just wanted to say with our busy schedule and a couple of canceled business meetings, this we wouldn't be able to put this back on until June 15th or June 22nd. All right, April, May, June. That's a month. It's okay. Yeah, so let's just, since we're going to be uh, maybe 2-2, two, two, let's just set this for the uh, next meeting. But we wouldn't necessarily have to have a presentation. Is this a public hearing? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. So you yeah. So we'd have to have a public hearing. This could take a few minutes, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? I well, I believe, Mr. Chair, you could open the public hearing. Yeah, let's uh, do that. I'll let's take testimony idea. now, and uh, then we, uh, we can then follow up at a subsequent. I'll leave it open for testimony. If right? you wish. Okay. All right. So now I've lost my paperwork. Where am I? mixed it up okay so where so I will open the public hearing on the uh, American with Disability Act ADA transition transition plan for public right away and ask if anyone would like to te testify on this matter uh, we'll leave the record open and set a date do can do we have to have a specific date June fifteenth. Well, can I can I can I uh, just make a comment? I I think that if we're really going to do something substantive, and maybe it's better that if we can postpone it. If you, if there is an impetus here to postpone it, maybe it's better that we postpone it till after the legislature till signing die, because we'll know what we have for transportation funding or not, because it all boils down to funding and understanding what you can spend with the state statute restrictions. We need to understand that that is a that's the component that we're really facing is funding. And this, is, this applies at the state level on state highways as well. It's a very complex issue, um, state, uh, transportation funding, and, uh, and I think that I don't see any funding changes between now and sine die. So one, one concern is that we have a plan we haven't adopted might open up uh, some liability? That's right. Uh, there's no hard and fast deadline. We okay. just want to have one, obviously, because we're required to. Yeah, I mean, w waiting is, you know, it, it's okay. I, I would say that the money part, you know, that's going to be dependent every year on the county commissioners passing a budget. So, I mean, you know, we can put whatever we want in the plan, but it's every year there's going to be a new budget, and that's how we'll decide and figure out how we can put money towards it. So. Well, then, then we won't even open the public hearing. For now, we'll set it for a date after the. We just did. Uh, no, we didn't uh, set it for a date. You mentioned after the legislature ends, which puts us in uh, December of 2090. No, no. Right. The hearing is currently open right now. The hearing is open as we yeah, speak. But I can, That's my point. We can just, yeah. I have a. Well, I could just back the tape up, take that section out. Delete, <laughs> delete. Yes. I, I, I must be missing something here, so I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, what, it, what is the issue that you're trying to address? Because I'm not clear on that. So the issue, this is a plan that prioritizes a process for how we move forward. And I've received some input, and I would like to just some more time to receive more input and, and get um, some advice regarding prioritizing specific need for people in the community, to, a way to prioritize, which is not part of this plan. That and um, additional information on the, there have been lawsuits. I am, I want to know, I want time to talk with staff because I haven't had that opportunity to sit down and ask my questions, which I don't want to take the time right now, but in light of what um, the lawsuit that was just settled with ODOT and how they went to the 15 year period, 
which was a compromise. I want more information about what that actually meant, what that means for us. I don't want to subject us to liability, which I think could be a possibility. I wanted to talk to staff about that. I just have questions about this that I would just like some more time. Well, I, I don't see any reason why we'd have to wait for the legislature to end, though. We could just do that specific date because the plan has the flexibility should we get more funds, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I, I don't know why we can't let let Commissioner Fisher get her answers, set the date in June, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, leave the hearing open. And so people can submit testimony during that time. You might have some folks who'd like to, and then uh, we'll have the, uh, the hearing on June 13th? June 15th at 10 a.m. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, we'll set that hearing date for June 15th at 10 a.m. All right, the next item on the agenda is a consent agenda. Ask the clerk to read the consent agenda. Okay, today's consent agenda. Under Health, Housing, and Human Services, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with Tri-County Metropolitan Transportation District of Oregon, TriMet, for Oregon Department of Transportation Special Transportation Formula discretionary funds for services for Clackamas County seniors and people with disabilities. Under elected officials, approval of previous business meeting minutes. And under public and government affairs, we have a board order approving an extension of the cable television franchise with Cable Telephone Association, DBA, Canby Telecom. And that concludes today's consent agenda. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the consent agenda. I second. Moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. The next item is county administrator updates. Yes, so thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I do realize that the hour is running late and we have a strategy meeting coming up, but I had a couple of items I really did want to share with you. Uh, and we have for our strategy meeting, we've ordered pizza and I promise you there's no anchovy on any of it. So uh, is there pepperoni? Uh, I'm sure there's pepperoni there. Okay. But Absolutely. you can't go to the meeting anyway. But I, uh, I wanted to share a couple of items with you. First, um, uh, last week was the deadline for our River Health uh, Stewardship Program, grant program. And I understand that we have received some 17 total applications uh, with projects uh, and programs aimed at improving our local watersheds. We have applications from a wide variety of community groups, nonprofit organizations, and businesses. And uh, next week, we'll be evaluating the proposals. Uh, we have $240,000 of funding to be able to uh, allocate to good projects uh, that have been submitted. I'll keep you informed as we learn of this. It's actually a uh, uh, timely, given that next week is our clean and plentiful drink wa uh, drinking water week. Uh, then I received a note uh, regarding our transportation and development staff. We continue to receive accolades uh, about our staff. Uh, in a couple of weeks back, uh, our director uh, of DTD, Barbara Cartmill, received the following note from local business owner Doug about uh, permit technician Jody Lagerway. She, and uh, Doug says, I had exceptional service earlier today from Jody Lagerway. I was applying for a development permit as well as an entrance permit when she shared how I could combine both into one. She did several things that seemed to be the right thing to do, which isn't always the case when dealing with the government, uh, <laughs> especially governments needing money. Uh, these things took extra time and her thoughtfulness was not lost on me. The bottom line is I hope you salute a job well done by Ms. Lagerway, and I know that she seemingly took a far-sighted and instinctive view of doing right things for me, and I very much appreciated it. So I just wanted to thank Doug for the note, and I especially want to thank Jody for doing the right thing and demonstrating our core values of service, professionalism, and respect. Thank you, Jody. And then I received uh, late yesterday uh, an email from an Eleanor Hunter uh, regarding Lindsay Wild, who works in our Business and Community uh, Services uh, Department, basically wanting to commend an exemplary employee of the county, Ms. Lindsay Wild, 
a property resource agent in business and community services. She worked with myself and two of my neighbors with great professionalism, integrity, and most especially humanity and genuine concern. What really stands out about Lindsay are her problem-solving skills and tenacity. She was a joy to work with from day one when I showed up unannounced at the DSB to the final signing, notarizing, and recording of paperwork. My neighbors and I are in complete agreement that Lindsay Wilde redefines the meaning of county employee. So thank you, uh, Ms. Hunter, and a special thanks to Lindsay for providing outstanding service. Ken? I just wanted to know, um, when you receive letters of that nature on behalf of our, our, of our employees, do they go into their personnel jackets? Oh, yes, yes. Good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Well, first up is Commissioner Fisher. All right. So I just want to share with my colleagues I spent yesterday in Salem advocating for justice reinvestment. It was really interesting because the way it was organized was around, we went with different counties. So we, I went with Multnomah County and Washington County and we learned all about what justice reinvestment is doing around the state. So just to give a little bit of information about this, justice reinvestment is money that goes back into programs that prevent recidivism and keeps our community safe. What we have chosen in Clackamas County, each county is different, each county looks at their local needs. What we have chosen to do is invest resources in victim, victim services for domestic violence and children, and also we have, we have the Transition Center, which helps people who are leaving the jail receive services for employment and transitioning back into the community, and we have focused on drug and alcohol treatment. Some interesting facts from yesterday is that we have provided more GEDs out of the Transition Center than Clackamas Community College. That was um, pretty interesting. And another interesting fact is that 99% of the folks who have gone through the Transition Center have not gone to prison. So that is another interesting statistics. Justin's reinvestment has saved taxpayers in the state $250 million because we have not needed to construct a new correctional facility for the state, which is a huge savings. And because of that, justice reinvestment dollars, just so my colleagues know, the current service level is in the co-chair's budget. But what is being requested and what the lobby day yesterday was to ask for $52 million back based on the savings that justice reinvestment dollars have provided for the state back to, to be distributed around the state. Clackamas County gets a small little piece, $2.48 million comes to us out of those out of that 52 million and we have put it to really good use and just to highlight focusing on prevention like my mother used to say an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and these programs really help us keep our community safe well great i actually served on the grant committee to <laughs> distribute those dollars and i'm hoping that they call us back together again and ask us to do that and we were actually advocating for that too because i'm on the Community Corrections Commission, and we're trying to figure out how we're going to uh, manage the cuts in community correction along with those uh, those other dollars. Measure fifty seven dollars and uh, is another issue. Great, thanks, thanks for your work. I didn't know you had done that. That's always fun. Ken, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'll be brief. I met with um, State Legislator Karen Power, one of our local ones and uh, Rick Gruen, our um, uh, Parks Department gentleman about cross-laminated timber. Karin was interested in pursuing that at the state level and seeing how she can help us with our objectives in, in uh, providing jobs in that field. Uh, yesterday I went to the luncheon, as many of us did, at the Abernathy Center for Parrot Creek. Uh, when I left, I know they had raised over $35,000, and I know that it exceeded that. I just don't know what the final numbers were. But as, um, when we talk about investing in, in, um, in rehabilitation and preventing people from going to prison, Parrot Creek's a good example of, of um, earlier inter intervention, uh, helping young men get, as we would say in the Marine Corps, get squared away and uh, go on to live a, a more productive life instead of winding up in prison. And I don't know their exact success rate, but um, I understand it to be better than the... Uh, than the alternative, shall we say. Um, and then over the weekend, I had the pleasure of uh, going to the Bite of Mount Hood, 
where they did a food drive as part of that event and uh, raised quite a bit of money uh, for food for uh, those that are disadvantaged in our communities. Um, went to a flower planting in uh, Oregon City where they were doing some beautification of, of their community and to the park in uh, Oak, excuse me, not Oak Grove, um, um, <laughs> Gladstone, where they had a, uh, a get together of the, of the community and, and things uh, at their little park. So it was some um, time well spent. And moving from that to um, our um, dog of the week. So this is Chip. Yes, like chocolate chip. He is a sensitive three-year-old Chihuahua Terrier who hasn't had many adventures in life before this big adventure he is having now. He is learning that when he wears his harness and leash, he can go outside and sniff so many smells in the grass. It's a weird feeling to be on a leash, but Chip is learning to enjoy it. He really likes people, but it takes a lot of courage for him to make new friends. Are you the one to help him on this new adventure? For more information about Chip and other adoptable dogs, please contact Clackamas County Dog Services at 503-655-8628 or www.clackamas.us forward slash dogs. Thank you. Paul? Well, <clears throat> I hope those who just watched that aren't going to be speeding down to the um, dog, our, our dog services deal to adopt that little guy, but I'm sure he's going to go fast. Yeah. So, uh, good job, Chip. Um, Commissioner Schrader's not here, so I'll just, in her absence, I'll read what she asked me to read about the arts and culture activities updates on the screen. Thank you, Mary. Um, the Clackamas Repertory Theater, uh, The Rabbit Hole, a free reading of The Rabbit Hole by David Lindsay Abair. Uh, Rabbit Hole is a drama that explores a family's grief over the death of a young child. On Saturday, May 6, 1 p.m. at the Happy Valley Library. I'm assuming that date re reflects the Clackamas Repertory Theater, okay. Uh, the book launch celebration, the Milwaukee Poultry Series and the Poetry Box present a reading to celebrate the lunch, or the launch, <laughs> of the new issue of the poem, Poeming Pigeon, Poems from the Garden. Enjoy this collection of over 80 poems that celebrates dirt under our fingernails, sharing zucchini with our neighbors, seed catalog dreams, and this labor of love we call gardening. That's on Saturday, May 6th, between 2 and 4 p.m. at the Letting Library Pond House in Milwaukee. And um, for more information, as you can see on the screen, you can go to uh, www.clackamasartsalliance.org um, uh, for more info. And that just happens by coincidence to be a great segue to what I want to talk about, and that's really about neighborhoods. Um, it's springtime, and uh, I was out mowing my lawn yesterday and mm -hmm. uh, saw some neighbors walking about, some new neighbors walking about, so happened to uh, engage in some conversation. I just want to just... Um, Something I've been working on, I think, has really driven me to a lot of um, community work is, is about how we really cherish our neighborhoods and uh, the people who live in them. And uh, fortunately, I'm in an area where it's, I, I think it's really, we have a diverse community um, in many ways. And I think that strengthening our communities and protecting our neighborhoods is something I'm very passionate about. And I think there's no better time right now than to get out in your neighbors, uh, get out in your neighborhoods, work in your yards, and help your neighbors with theirs and just to enjoy one another's yards, their gardens, and this is just a great time. I know that uh, it's just a lot of people were in a very um, uh, friendly state. Um, and as the weather gets better, we'll have more of those opportunities, but I know we all take pride in our neighborhoods, and it's something that's important to me, and it's probably important to a lot of folks that we keep our neighborhoods clean and safe and friendly. And with that, because we have been here so long, I'm gonna cut my comment short today. All my neighbors appeared to have burst into flames yesterday. It turns out that they were all vampires. Hadn't seen the sun in so long. <laughs> I probably have a sunburned head. Um, I'd like to relay some sad news. Over the weekend, we lost uh, one of our longtime television video producers, uh, Mark Ivanish. Ivanish. Uh, Mark worked. Oh, this is the guy who died. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, it's, all, it's always great to have pictures because, you know, I knew his first name, but I didn't know. I mean, that's terrible. 
My goodness. Mark worked with the county for over 16 years and played a key role in many of our most important productions. Since 2001, he directed, edited, and or voiced over a thousand videos for us. He was known by the staff as the voice of Clackamas County. Mark was a fixture in our production booth, typically being a video director of our weekly business meeting. He had probably been to most business meetings uh, more business means in all of us, maybe more than anyone ever. He uh, was a lead producer for town halls and other high profile events like the Larry Dahl Memorial uh, rededication or state of the county. Mark's knowledge and experience was second to none. He was a diligent, incredible, reliable, and by all accounts, a great guy. Our condolences go to his uh, surviving family, including his son, Dylan. He will be missed by staff, producers, and all involved in our production process. Uh, with that, we'll adjourn today's meeting in Mark's name. We're adjourned. <laughs>